Perhaps you've had this happen to you before. You go to the movie theater and amusement park and you eat the saltiest, biggest food possible and you go to bed feeling rather full and in pain, but you go to bed happy and you wake up the next morning and think to yourself, when's the last time I peed? You can thank ADH for that. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here. Today we're talking about ADH, antidiuretic hormone. We're gonna go through what it does, when and where it is released, and then how it actually works or the mechanism of action. So let's begin with the name, as always, antidiuretic hormone. Well, we know that hormones are chemical messengers that travel in the blood and they change cell functions in order to maintain homeostasis. Now, we know that, but antidiuretic, what type of change are we gonna make on those cells? Well, diuretic, we know, means to urinate. But if we're anti-diuretic, we're against urination, so this hormone is going to make you not pee, or make you hold on to water. So we can write that for what it does first. But how exactly does it inhibit us from peeing? Well, that water that could be excreted out as urine, we're actually going to take it and throw it back into the bloodstream, and that's called reabsorption of water. So ADH aids in reabsorbing water. That sounds nice. That probably keeps us hydrated, right? We keep water in our bloodstream, which is a good thing. But the question is, when do we need to release this and where is it happening? So let's talk about first where it's released from. You see this structure right here? This is actually the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is called the master regulator gland. It's got like nine different hormones it secretes, and we divide it up into two sections. The anterior section, we're going to say, is here on the left, and the posterior, or the back side, will be here on the right. So we're going to be focusing here on the posterior pituitary gland. And you can see that there are orange cells, these are called neurons, and they are going to be housed in the hypothalamus, which is this brain region right above the pituitary gland. And as you can see, the neuron cell body, so these circles here, are going to extend their axons, or their signaling branch, all the way down into the posterior pituitary, and actually synapse, in a way, connect with the bloodstream of the posterior pituitary. Now this is interesting. As you can see, the antidiuretic hormone, designated as an orange triangle, is sitting at the ends of these neurons' axons, and it's going to be sent into the bloodstream directly. And that will happen whenever these neurons get excited or stimulated to send that signal and release ADH into the bloodstream. Now the question is, once again, when does that happen? Well, this is an absolutely fascinating process. So here I've zoomed into one of these neurons here, and we're actually going to look at the bloodstream next to it because the bloodstream is going to influence when that neuron sends a signal. Now, think back to the story I told at the very beginning. You ate very, very salty popcorn. And whenever you eat salty foods in general, that stuff, that salt, gets into your bloodstream. So you quite literally get salty, just like you and I, whenever bad things happen to us or people wrong us or what have you. But in this case, the saltiness is transferred into the bloodstream. And now that can be a problem because remember, all that I've talked about so far is maintaining that homeostasis, that internal balance of your body. And your bloodstream has a homeostatic range when it comes to its saltiness. And we call that osmolarity. And osmolarity is just a measure of how much solute or salt stuff is in the fluid of the blood. And like I said, the blood has a homeostatic set point or range that it likes to stay within. And that number is 290 milliosmoles. So again, just 290 milliosmoles, that's just a measure of how salty the blood is. You can contrast that with the ocean water, which is about 1,000 milliosmoles, and then pure water, which is zero milliosmoles, because there's no salt in pure water. Now, in the bloodstream, I'm going to say, after you ate all that salty popcorn, we're going to go from 290 milliosmoles to say, what do you think? If you ate a bunch of salty popcorn, do you think this number is going to go up or go down? Well, think about it. If the popcorn is really salty, that's solute. And so if you're dumping a lot of that into the bloodstream, more and more and more solute, we're actually going to increase that number. And maybe it'll get to, say, 320. So our blood has become too salty. What do we do about it? Well, if we're too salty, can't we dilute it? And how do we dilute it? Well, we need to add more solvent or fluid. Your alarm bell should be ringing and you should be like, hey, that's what antidiuretic hormone does. It brings water, the solvent or the fluid, back into the blood, and it's going to help to basically take that number and bring it back to homeostasis. But first we have to figure out how we take like salty blood and have these neurons respond to that saltiness with releasing ADH. And this is what actually happens, which is absolutely fascinating. I think this is so cool. Anytime you put a cell in a relatively salty environment, we know that water loves to follow salt. And the cell is made of a lot of water. And so if the blood got really salty, well then this water is going to want to leave through these little channel proteins called aquaporins, and it's going to go into the bloodstream. Just a little bit, not too much. These cells are really tiny. But what do you think that will do to this neuron? Well, let me draw it and see if you got it right. 
the cell shrivels up. And what is absolutely fascinating about this is when that cell shrivels up because the water's leaving, that cell gets excited. Whenever it shrivels, it gets excited. And that means it's going to obtain a positive charge, which is also called depolarization. You can learn more about that here. And once it gets positive enough, it's actually going to send its signal or action potential and tell this axon to release those ADH molecules. So by doing that, once ADH is released, it's going to go into the bloodstream and then make its effect specifically on the kidneys so that we can reabsorb more water throughout the body. So that's the main way that we release ADH in our bodies. Now, the second way is a little different, and that's when in a molecule called angiotensin II, which is also a hormone, can actually bind to receptors on the neuron, thus making the neuron positive once again to send its signal. Now, angiotensin II is a part of the RAS system, which I made a short video about that right here if you're interested in that, but it's basically made whenever the blood volume drops, which makes sense because if our blood volume drops, that's bad, so we need to bring volume back up. And what better way to do that than to bring water back into the blood? Awesome. So now we know what ADH does, when and where it is released, but now we need to figure out how it actually works. What about this weird little molecule called ADH, the triangle? How is it going to bring water back into the bloodstream on a big scale? Well, in order to figure that out, we got to look at the kidneys. So the ADH is going to travel to the kidneys. And we know that the kidneys are the filters of our blood, right? So they're going to keep some stuff in the blood. They're going to excrete stuff out as urine from the blood. So the question is, how does this hormone change what the kidney is excreting so that instead of peeing out more water, we're going to bring that water back into the bloodstream? So let's check out what's happening here. Once that ADH gets here, we're going to look inside the functional unit of the kidney, which is called the nephron. And if we zoom in here, we've got blood that's going to be filtered in this little region here called the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule. And some of that fluid is going to leak out of the blood and get filtered. What that means is that fluid is going to follow a path down this tubule all the way around. And if it remains in the kidney tubule, actually this gets excreted out as urine. But as you can see, surrounding that tubule that will end up as pee, we also have a blood supply. Now remember, the goal of ADH is to take stuff then from that tubule, water specifically, take that water and instead of keep it in the tubule as urine, we want to throw it back into the bloodstream. So how do we do that? Well, we're gonna zoom in on a specific section of the nephron called the distal convoluted tubule, shortened up DCT. And we're gonna look at the black cells lining it. And we're gonna see how these cells will respond to that ADH in order to bring water that's in the tubule right here, destined to become urine, and we're going to see how it pulls that water back into the bloodstream. Before we do that, if this has been helpful for you at all, please consider subscribing to Organized Biology and liking this video. I greatly appreciate it. And I promise to make a lot of content to benefit you people in the healthcare profession or just those who want to learn about their bodies a little more. Now, to figure out how ADH works, we need to know its other common name, and that's called arginine vasopressin. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is, number one, anatomists are annoying. They name one structure like five different names, which is annoying. But this one's a little more helpful because it ends in that IN. And we know that an IN hormone is a peptide or a protein hormone. And you can learn more about these different hormone types in this video here. But the way peptide hormones act on cells and change their function is actually by binding to what's called extracellular receptors on the target cell membrane. So in this case, ADH is going to act on a protein receptor called a G-protein coupled receptor. And they kind of look like this weird snake-like thing. And that ADH is going to bind to the extracellular receptor right here and trigger the G protein on the inside of the cell to then do something. Now that G protein, interestingly enough, is going to go through a cascade of events in the cell and eventually increase intracellular calcium ions. Okay, what does calcium have to do with this? Well, calcium, if you've seen any of my other videos, loves to move things. It's, a, it's like an ion, a little charged atom that just loves to push stuff out. And in this case, inside of these cells, we will have little vesicles. And these vesicles are basically little capsules containing stuff most of the time. But in this case, they're vesicles with little water channels here. And these water channels are called aquaporins, literally translating to water hole protein. So it's a hole that allows water to pass in and out. We saw that earlier with these neurons where the water was passing out of the neuron. And so these aquaporins get pushed out by the calcium to both sides of the membrane. And as they get pushed out, what we're doing is we're embedding the membrane full of these aquaporins, these water hole proteins. And through a concentration gradient within the kidneys, this water is going to get pulled from the tubule that's ending up as urine, and it's actually going to get pulled through these cells and come back into the bloodstream. 
And hopefully by doing that, we're going to take this salty blood that we had at 320, and once we bring back more water into the bloodstream, hopefully that will return to that 290 milliosmol homeostatic set point that our blood likes to stay in.